But someone would have talked, say the self-styled skeptics that believe the government's official conspiracy theory of 9-11. After all, every major conspiracy has its whistleblowers, doesn't it? But there's a problem with this logically fallacious non-argument. Someone did talk. In fact, numerous people have come out to blow the whistle on the events of September 11, 2001, and the cover-up that surrounds those events. These are the stories of the 9-11 whistleblowers. You are tuned in to The Corbett Report. When people talk of the bravery exhibited by ordinary men and women during the traumatic hours of the 9-11 attacks, they are talking about people like William Rodriguez. Indeed, of the many stories of selflessness and courage to have emerged from that fateful day, it would be difficult to find one more heroic than that of William Rodriguez, dubbed the last man out because, as a janitor holding a master key to the building, he risked his life till the very moment of the tower's destruction, helping those trapped inside the towers to escape. William Rodriguez was working as a janitor at the World Trade Center when the towers were attacked. Using a master key, he ran to open as many doors as he could before exiting and becoming buried alive. So they started looking under the rubble, and once I got pulled from under the rubble, hours after, I was in shock. Why? Because I couldn't find any of those buildings. Rodriguez had one of only five master keys to unlock the doors in the middle stairwell and lead firefighters up floor by floor. I went and picked up the man on the wheelchair and I started going down. The building started to oscillate so hard. He saved several lives that day. Then suddenly, Rodriguez heard a terrible rumbling like the sound of an earthquake. I saw it was a total disaster. And all I hear is run, run, run. Like so many others, Rodriguez ran from the cloud of debris and dove under a fire truck. We went up by the stairs with the Port Authority police to uh, start rescuing people. A lot of people were coming out, uh, but there was a lot of people that stayed there. We brought a lot of people on wheelchairs and a lot of people on uh, uh, gurneys, uh, all people that couldn't make it because there was no elevator service. The, the elevator went out. The World Trade Center towers were built as a Class A building. That means that in the case of a fire, every third floor in both towers is closed to prevent a backdraft. It is the reason that Rodriguez's master key was so crucial to getting people out. It was hard. The amount of heat that was generated because of uh, the fire was coming down. The smoke, it was an acrid smoke because you could feel it on your throat. He saw firefighters carrying 100 pounds worth of equipment on their backs, waiting for a freight elevator that would never come. That elevator was demolished. So Rodriguez led them up another way, using a back pathway that only he knew. After the sky lobby collapsed, he finally listened to police who told him to get out. He was not prepared for what he was about to see. When I look around, I find all the bodies of the people that jump out of the building. They came out of the building and say, I saved myself. And a piece of debris came in and killed them. As one of the heroes of that day, a man whose story encapsulates all the tragedy and drama of 9-11, William Rodriguez is no stranger to the glare of the media spotlight. Not only has he been interviewed for dozens of news programs and reports on the events of September 11, 2001, and been featured as a spokesman for the survivors at multiple events and on many reports, he has also been awarded for his courage that day and even invited to a White House dinner where he was honored by President Bush for his bravery. But carefully curated from most mainstream reports on Rodriguez's remarkable story is an equally remarkable fact. This 9-11 hero is in fact a 9-11 whistleblower, someone who has contradicted the official story of the September 11th attacks from day one. According to Rodriguez, the first explosion that he felt that day was not the impact of the plane nearly 100 stories above him, but an explosion below him from one of the sub-basement levels. That morning, I was supposed to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning every day. I called my supervisor because I was not going to work. I was going to take a sick day. 
made it there at 8.30 in the morning, go straight to the lobby, down to the basement. The building has six sub-levels of basement, B1, B2, all the way down to B6. Basement 6, basement 5, all the way up to basement 1, where all Port Authority areas. Some of them have parking for, for tenants, some of them have storage. B1 office, B1 level, is where they have the support office for my company, the cleaning company, American Building Maintenance. So I was talking to the supervisor, and at 846 we hear BOOM! An explosion so hard that pushes upwards in the air, upwards. And it came out from below us, from the mechanical room that was right below us. And it was so loud and so powerful that all the walls cracked, the false ceiling fell on top of us, the sprinkler system got activated, and everybody started screaming so loud because they didn't know what was going on. And the first thing I'm going to say is that a generator just blew up on the B2 level, the level below me. And everybody's screaming. And when I'm going to verbalize it, six to seven seconds after, we hear, bah! the impact all the way on the top of the building of the plane. Two different events separated by s almost seven seconds, separated by time. And now, it, I work in the building for 20 years. I know the difference of a sound coming from the top and one from the bottom. So when everybody started, what the heck is going on? A person comes running into the office saying, explosion, explosion. His hands extended, all the skin pulled from under his armpits, on both arms, hanging. And we thought it was clothing. It was part of his clothes. Until he gets closer, he was coming like this, like a zombie. Explosion, explosion. And when I looked at him, I realized it was his skin. Like when you take off a glove and you let it hang in. And when I get to see his face, all this part was hanging of his face. And everybody started screaming in horror. And I say, don't move. The, the, the guy was a black guy named Felipe David. Worked for a company called Aramark. Rodriguez's story provides startling and credible eyewitness testimony that undermines the official myth that there were no explosives in the Twin Towers that morning. Rodriguez is insistent on a number of points. That there was a loud and distinct noise at 8.46 a.m., that it came from beneath them in the sub-basement level and blew them upwards, and that it notably preceded the sound of the plane impact above them. This has led Rodriguez to conclude that there was an explosion in the sub-basement before the plane impacted the North Tower, something which the 9-11 Commission and other official government investigations into the attacks denies. And, Importantly, Rodriguez has been telling this same story, including the same detail about Felipe David, since the day of 9-11 itself. William Rodriguez is a maintenance worker at the Trade Center, I believe. In any case, he's on the phone with us now. Mr. Rodriguez, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Tell me where you were when, well, which of the two buildings uh, were you in? I work on the building one. The and one that got hit uh, the first time. Tell me what happened. Uh, I was on the basement, which is a support floor for the maintenance company. And uh, we hear like a big rumble. Not like an impact, like a rumble. Uh, like something uh, like moving furniture on a, on a, on a massive way. And uh, all of a sudden we hear another rumble and a guy comes running, running into our office. And all his skin was off his body. All his skin, we, we went crazy, we started screaming, we told him to get out. We took everybody out of the office, outside to the loading dock area, and then I went back in. And uh, when I went back in, I saw people, I heard uh, people that were stuck on an elevator, on a freight elevator, because all the elevators went down. And water was going in, and they were probably getting drowned. And we get a couple of pipes and opened the elevator and we got the people out. If it were only William Rodriguez who heard, saw, and experienced explosions inside the Twin Towers that morning, then such testimony would be easy enough to rationalize away. 
Maybe Rodriguez had become confused in the chaos of that morning. Maybe he had interpreted the sound and explosion incorrectly. Maybe he was lying to gain attention. But William Rodriguez is not the only person who heard, saw, and experienced explosions inside the Twin Towers that morning. In fact, hundreds of people, including office workers, police, firefighters, and others, have reported explosions all throughout the morning, from before the moment of plane impact all the way up to the explosive demolition of the towers themselves. What was it like? What was it like? Horrible. It's like hell. You don't want to know. The whole building just collapsed on us inside the lobby. Was that a secondary explosion? Yes, it was. That was the planet probably? Yeah, definitely a secondary explosion. But we was inside waiting to go upstairs. And on our way upstairs, the whole fucking thing blew. And we just, we just collapsed from everybody inside the lobby. Similar to the first car was coming down, secondary? I don't know about the first one, but I know the second one, was, it was terrible. Then there was a third one, too, after that one. Third explosion after that? Yes, sir. You were Everybody was inside the building, the way you go upstairs, and they, they, just, they just let loose. Everything just let loose inside the building. So what, what you told me is that there was a plane or whatever hit the building, and then a the secondary explosion. It was like three explosions after that. We came in after the after the fire. We came when the fire was going on already. We was in the staging area inside the building, okay. waiting to go upstairs. The whole and then it the exploded. The whole, the whole lobby collapsed on the lobby inside. And you were working there? As yes, I was right there. I was in the be I was down in the basement, came down, all of a sudden the elevator blew up, smoke. I dragged the guy out, his skin was hanging off, and I dragged him out, and I helped him out of the, out of, to the ambulance. Arthur Del Bianco is one of the lucky few, able to tell a tale of survival from a hospital bed. Judy, all of a sudden it was like bang, 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 like bullet shots, and then all of a sudden three tremendous explosions, and everything started coming down. I think a bomb went off in the lobby first, then a plane hit the building, but then another plane hit the other building. And But when I was coming through the doors on the other side of the Trade Center, something, either they blew the lobby up or, or something, because it blew the glass out of the doors and knocked us all down, and I got a uh, smoke and everything on me. We made it outside, we made it about a block. We made it at least two blocks, two blocks. and we started running. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if they had detonated, dead, yeah, dead, 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 they were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down, I was watching right. it and running. Right. These stories, collected haphazardly by reporters at the scene that day, paint a very different picture of 9-11 than that portrayed by NIST in the 9-11 Commission. Rather than a progressive collapse due to fire and burning jet fuel, these stories suggest that what was happening inside the Twin Towers that morning was in fact a series of explosive events. Explosive events that were powerful enough to cause internal collapses within the building well below the point of the plane impacts and fires, and even, according to multiple witnesses, events that preceded the impact of the plane. But is there more systematic and rigorously collected evidence of these explosions? Is there a repository of such testimony that would confirm what Rodriguez and many others have affirmed since the day of 9-11 itself? Namely, that there were explosions taking place inside the buildings that morning. In fact, there is such a repository. In the wake of 9-11, New York Fire Commissioner Thomas Von Essen ordered the collection of oral testimony from firefighters, paramedics, and emergency medical technicians who responded to the attacks that morning. That collection, amounting to more than 12,000 pages of testimony from 503 people, was then promptly sealed. It took a lawsuit and four years of court battle for the collection to be finally released to the public. One of the researchers who spent time poring over that testimony was Graeme McQueen, a retired associate professor at McMaster University and the former director of that university's Peace Studies Center. What he found in that repository of oral history, and presented in a scholarly article for the Journal of 9-11 Studies, was an unmistakable pattern. Time after time, these first responders reported experiencing explosions in the Twin Towers. Explosions that cannot be accounted for in NIST's official explanation of the tower's destruction. There is our, our other eyewitness explosion evidence that corroborates Rodriguez, at least in a general way, meaning that there were people talking about explosions in the basement. There were lots of people talking about 
tremendous explosions and fire in some of the elevators, blowing the doors off elevators. Um, and some of this testimony is can be found on the internet. Uh, I found some of it in the FDNY oral histories. Um, you know, firefighters talking about the doors being blown off elevators. And um, so there was some kind of very destructive event. Also, the windows in the lobby, which were very strong windows, were blown out by the time most of the firefighters got there. And as one of them said, it looked like a plane hit the lobby. There were other explosions that went off over the next hour or so before the buildings started to come down. And when they came down, there were patterns of explosion. Uh, from around the point of plane impact all the way down. Uh, apparently, they were, we were supposed to believe that the building was coming down because of structural failure. But again, these were timed very well um, to go off in a particular way. And this is one of the reasons we know that these were explosions and that there, this was a controlled demolition. Um, there were patterns and they were explosions that were extremely strong, uh, taking out these massive buildings and pulverizing them in less than 20 seconds. This was not structural failure. Rodriguez's story was not some fanciful invention that he spun during the most dramatic and horrific hours of his life. It is a story that fits into a pattern of explosive testimony related by many other witnesses that day. It is also a story that is deeply uncomfortable for those in the government and the media who were eager to celebrate the acts of bravery New Yorkers committed that day, but who will never report the explosive truth about the events at the World Trade Center that demolished the official government conspiracy theory of 9-11. It is remarkable that Rodriguez immediately recognized and celebrated for his heroism on that day, would continue to insist on his story, even as the official story, the one that insisted there were no explosives used that day, began to take shape. But he did. For years, Rodriguez used his speaking opportunities on mainstream media and at memorials and commemoration events to inform the public about explosions in the Twin Towers that morning. Unsurprisingly, Despite the attention and accolades he received for his remarkable story in the early days of 9-11, he soon found himself becoming persona non grata in the mainstream media because he refused to go along with the official lies about what happened that morning. He says safety, fire department of New York. A rescue jacket he wore over his torn shirt, a lantern from the rubble. It doesn't work, but another memory from 9-11. And a piece of marble from high up on the 44th floor. This saved for a decade. I put it in my pocket because it was just such a shocking uh, realization. As well as memories that he relives every single day. I was put from the rubble and I started looking for other people and I only found uh, pieces of human beings. William Rodriguez, a janitor in the Twin Towers for almost 20 years, a 9-11 survivor who saved hundreds of lives on September 11th by unlocking door after door for firefighters and dragging out at least a dozen people with his own bare hands. Known as the last man out before the World Trade Center collapsed, his unlikely story had the media glued to him like bees to honey. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things like William Rodriguez. Becoming a voice for the victims, Rodriguez was honored as an American hero only to be left homeless in the aftermath of the tragedy. Funny thing, I will give the 800 number on camera, and when I call the 800 number, they deny me the help. And shunned by the mainstream media soon after. Uh, censorship. I believe that censorship started from the very beginning because when I was telling my story, they told me, oh, cut this out, cut this out. No longer a sweetheart of American broadcasts, William now talks mostly to foreign outlets. The reason? His version of 9-11 differed from the official scenario. It was the first hijacked plane that hit the... It was the first hijacked plane. No, hello, that was an explosion before 9-11, before the plane hit the tower. Even more remarkably, Rodriguez went beyond simply telling the truth about what he witnessed that day. Little known even to those who are familiar with his story is that Rodriguez has used his notoriety and media opportunities to advocate for 9-11 survivors who are suffering from the health effects incurred in the aftermath of the tower's destruction. He has even taken the fight for 9-11 truth to the political arena, 
forcing the government's hand in convening a public commission to investigate the attacks, something that the Bush administration fought tooth and nail to prevent. The 9-11 Commission is a book of 576 pages and 576 pages of lies because the 9-11 Commission exists because I went with three other people to Congress to ask that we wanted a formal investigation of the events of 9-11. And you may remember that the president said, we don't need an investigation, we know who did it. That was the wrong thing to say to the families. We had the right and we wanted to know. So we, we press for an investigation. They didn't want it. So we use a technique that they have used against a lot of the people uh, with the excuse of the war. We put widows. We put wives. We put fathers that love their loved ones on every television show and every news network to ask for an investigation. And they couldn't handle the emotional toll that that will create on the American public. So we got the investigation. I testified behind closed doors. They didn't want me to do the testimony in an open hearing. Everything else, everybody else, open hearings. You saw the hearings. Mine was behind closed doors. I agree because I did not know what was the process? And I thought up to that point that they were going to do the right thing. We created the Family Steering Committee, and we gave the commission 168 questions to answer. We only have 22 of those questions answered. We wanted to have a family member to be part of the commission, and they say, we don't want to allow that because they will have access to national security papers and a lot of uh, fling flam and balonies. We never got it. So we have to press for questions to be answered. We never got those, those answers. Up to that point, we thought that they were going to do the right thing. The final report shows up. What a surprise. My whole testimony was omitted. It doesn't appear. 27 people that I gave them to, to uh, interrogate, they, not, they didn't call, not even one of them. That the 9-11 Commission's work was subverted and undermined by conflicts of interest and deliberate cover-up is perhaps to be expected. But the efforts of people like William Rodriguez have been instrumental in advocating for those left quite literally in the dust of 9-11. Those whose stories are too problematic for the official 9-11 narrative to be given any credence or attention. As Gray McQueen points out, the story told by William Rodriguez and the other witnesses to explosions in the Twin Towers that day is not a peripheral issue or a minor footnote in the story of 9-11. On the contrary, it is of central importance. Either Rodriguez and the other witnesses to explosions independent of the planes and fires are wrong, or they are right. And if they are right, we are forced to the conclusion that the official story of 9-11 is not just mistaken, but that it is a deliberate fraud that has been perpetrated on the American public and the broader public around the world for nearly two decades. Well, that would obviously indicate that somehow this building was wired for explosions and that there had been a plan made in advance of the plane attacks to destroy this building. And that means the official story about, you know, Mohammed Atta and the other 18 hijackers flying planes is, is an incorrect story, that it, that it indicates that there was to use the classic word, an inside job. Somehow insiders, deep insiders, got in the building and readied it for annihilation on that day. And it also indicates that the story we've been told is false and really knowingly false because, of course, Rodriguez and many other eyewitnesses to explosions were ignored or silenced or lied about by the official investigating agencies, which means that the whole 9-11 story is a fraud. Ultimately, the story of Rodriguez is important, not just for what it tells us about the official 9-11 narrative, or even for what it tells us about the way that power operates in society. It is important because it shows us what ordinary men and women are capable of in extreme situations. 
It reminds us that, in times of distress, we are still capable of coming together to help those around us. And it provides us with an example of someone who will not stop telling his truth, even when it becomes unpopular. Our wounds are still open, we're still hurting, uh, we're still going through the process of uh, the traumatic uh, shock uh, syndrome, uh, PTSD. Um, um, you call me a hero, I call myself a survivor. For me, the heroes died on 9-11, in, in my opinion, because they died helping others. Uh, I, I just had the only tool available for me at that time to do great things, so I was, I'm a survivor. I have that uh, survivor's guilt. Uh, why did I survive and my friends didn't? And now 16 years after, it hits me stronger uh, because uh, I see the families, I see new families that came out from people that I uh, saved. And, and I always wonder, you know, what would have happened if those people that I lost, those 200 friends, will be, al will be alive today? And uh, it, it hits you, it hits you hard. So 16 years after, we're still dealing with um, uh, the backlash of uh, what happened on that day. 9-11 changed me. They changed the world. We all know that. But it changed me in more ways than I expected. I know what I heard. I heard explosions. We'd like to have the person get a visa to come to the United States. Can you do it? The concentrations are such that they don't pose a health hazard. So now they're walking back toward the World Trade Center. And as we keep letting you hear the personal stories, the survivor stories of exactly what happened inside the World Trade Center when that first plane went in, and of course the collapses since then, we're going to bring more of those to you now. Barry Jennings, you were on the eighth floor. You work for the city housing department. Explain to me the moment of impact. Well, me and Mr. Hesh, the corporation council, were on the 23rd floor. I told them we got to get, get out of here. We started walking down the stairs. We made it to the eighth floor. Big explosion. Blew us back into the eighth floor. And I turned to Hesh, I said, this is it, we're dead. We're, we're not gonna make it out of here. I took uh, a fire extinguisher and I bust the window out. That's when this gentleman, this gentleman here heard my cries for help. This gentleman right here, and he said, kept, kept saying, stand by, somebody's coming to get you. They, could, they couldn't get to us for an hour because they couldn't find us. You thought that was it? I thought, I thought we're dead. I thought that was it. I, I started praying to Allah, I said, that's it, we're gone. In 2001, Barry Jennings was the Deputy Director of Emergency Services for the New York City Housing Authority. After the first plane hit the North Tower at 8.46 a.m. on the morning of 9-11, Jennings was called to the city's Office of Emergency Management in World Trade Center Building 7, along with Corporation Counsel Michael Hess, to help coordinate the emergency response. Entering Building 7 together before the strike on the South Tower at 9.03 a.m., Jennings and Hess were surprised to discover that the office had been abandoned. Receiving a phone call from his superior, Jennings was warned to leave the building immediately. Descending via the stairwell, Jennings and Hess reached the sixth floor before an explosion blew them back up to the eighth floor, trapping them inside the building. After hours of chaos and confusion, including the collapse of the Twin Towers and repeated attempts to draw the attention of first responders, the pair were finally rescued by firefighters. Hours later, World Trade Center Building 7 also known as the Salomon Brothers Building, collapsed at freefall acceleration directly into the path of most resistance. After seven years of investigation, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, determined that the building had not come down due to explosives or controlled demolition, as many alleged, or due to structural damage from the collapse of the Twin Towers, an explosion in the building's fuel oil systems, or any of the other suggestions that had been put forward and retracted by NIST over the course of its investigation. Instead, NIST spokesman Shyam Sunder insisted that the building had collapsed due to ordinary office fires. The collapse of World Trade Center 7 on 9-11 was a rare event. Our study has identified thermal expansion as a new phenomenon that can cause the collapse of a structure. 
For the first time, we have shown that fire can induce a progressive collapse. Jennings' remarkable story was captured by Jeff Rosen, reporting on the ground for WABC-TV, just moments after he and Hess had been rescued from the building. But it wasn't until several years later that Dylan Avery and Jason Burmis, the creators of Loose Change, the first viral internet documentary, discovered the clip of that interview from the day of 9-11 and realized that Jennings' testimony was one of the few eyewitness accounts of one of the deepest mysteries of that day, the destruction of WTC-7. So while we were doing research um, for obviously our next cut of the film, uh, Loose Change Final Cut, you know, Loose Change Second Edition gave us a real opportunity to go around and do an investigation. And we had had so much archived footage sent to us because this was long before the days of the internet where you get something high quality on the spot. And Dylan found footage of Barry Jennings that had been unedited that we had not seen that really suggested that he was absolutely in Building 7. And we also correlated that with him being with uh, Michael Hess. And Michael Hess was the right-hand man of Giuliani. Uh, he was the city corporation counsel. Here's a still shot of him behind me. And then uh, you can see him here sitting next to Giuliani. So uh, pretty much as close as it gets. And, you know, we made this connection. And actually, I had reached out to Hess via email. I heard nothing back. And to, you know, the proper parties, nothing back. But Dylan tracked down. Barry Jennings in his city office, and Barry did respond, and uh, Barry said, come on down, so me and Dylan went down with a camera, and uh, once we got in there and started talking to him, I remember, like, the first thing that I saw, you know, he was obviously, I'd say, not the highest up guy, but very, you know, he had his own office, he was well respected, he had the key to the city, you know, we had talked about the key to the city after this event. And he even told us how he had seen Loose Chain Second Edition. Uh, basically, what I can remember, he was pretty sympathetic to our cause. He talked to us about fire at Fahrenheit 9-11. And uh, from there, we tried to find a, a spot to get him. And I remember he drove us out there. We were in the back, one of his suits hanging up. Uh, I remember we even talked about his family, you know, being out in Long Island. Very friendly guy. And uh, we got him on the pier. And listen, the interview is what it is. We've released it in full. Um, we didn't edit anything. We didn't coerce the guy. And uh, I think what he says is about as telling as it gets. As telling as it gets. Indeed, Barry Jennings' story is telling. As the only documented eyewitness testimony of the events taking place inside World Trade Center 7 during the hours of the attack, the accounts of Barry Jennings and Michael Hess are essential to coming to an understanding of the destruction of that building. And, most telling of all, it contradicts the official, government-approved story of Building 7's destruction in many important ways. As I told you guys before, it's very, it's very uh, funny. I was on my way to work, and uh, traffic was excellent. I received a call that. Uh, a small Cessna had hit the uh, World Trade Center. And I was asked to go and uh, man the uh, Office of Emergency Management at the World Trade Center 7 on the 23rd floor. As I arrived there, there were police all in the lobby. They, um, they showed me the way to the elevator. We got up to the uh, 23rd floor. Me and Mr. Hess, who I didn't know was Mr. Hess at the time, we got to the 23rd floor. Uh, we couldn't get in. We had to go back down. Then security and police took us to the freight elevators where they took us back up and we did get in. Upon arriving into the OEM uh, EOC, we noticed that everybody was gone. I saw coffee that was on a desk. Still, the smoke was still coming off the coffee. I saw, I saw uh, half-eaten sandwiches. And... Uh, only me, Mr. Hess, was up there. Um, after I called several individuals, one individual told me that um, to leave and leave right away. Mr. Hess came running back in and said, we're the only ones up here, we got to get out of here. He found the stairwell. So we, we subsequently went to the stairwell and we're there. Um, after I called several individuals, one individual told me that... Um, to leave and leave right away. Mr. Hess came running back in and said, we're the only ones up here, we gotta get out of here. He found the stairwell. 
So we, we subsequently went to the stairwell and we're going down the stairs. When we reached the eighth or the sixth floor, the landing that we were standing on gave way. There was an explosion and the landing gave way. And we're, I was left there hanging. I had to climb back up and now I had to walk back up to the eighth floor. After getting to the eighth floor, everything was dark. It was dark and it was very, very hot. Very hot. Um, I asked Mr. Hess to test the phones as I took a fire extinguisher and broke out the windows. Once I broke out the windows, I could see outside below me, I saw uh, police cars on fire, buses on fire. Uh, I looked one way, the building was there. I looked the other way, it was gone. Um, I was trapped in there for several hours. I was trapped in there when, when both buildings came down. Um, the firefighters came, they came to the window, and they, because I was going to come out on the fire hose. I didn't want to stay there any longer. It was too hot. I was going to come out on the fire hose. They came to the window, and they said, they started yelling, do not do that. It won't hold you. And then they ran away. See, I didn't know what was going on. That's when one, the first tower fell. When they started running, the first tower was coming down. I had no, I had no way of knowing that. Then I saw them come back. Now I saw them come back with more concern on their faces. And then they ran away again. The second tower fell. So as they turned and ran the second time, the guy said, don't worry, we'll be back for you. And they did come back. This time they came back with 10 firefighters. Um, and they kept asking, where are you? We don't know where you are. I said, I'm on the north side of the building because when I was on the stairs, I saw north side. Excuse me. Uh, all this time, I'm hearing all type of explosions. All this time, I'm hearing explosions. And I'm thinking that maybe it's the uh, buses around me that were on fire, the cars are on fire. But I don't see no, you know, but I'm still hearing these explosions. When they finally got to us and they took us down to what what they they uh, called the lobby because I asked them, I said, when we got down there, I said, where are we? He said, this was the lobby. And I said, you gotta be kidding me. It was total ruins, total ruins. Now keep in mind, when I came in there, the lobby had nice escalators. It was a huge lobby. And for me to see what I saw, it was unbelievable. And the firefighter that took us down kept saying, do not look down. And I kept saying, why? He said, do not look down. And we were stepping over people. And you know you can feel when you're stepping over people. They took us out through a hole that the, I don't know who made this hole in this wall. That's how they got us out. They took us out through a hole, through the wall, to safety. As they were taking me out, one firefighter had fallen. I believe he was having a heart attack. But before that, this big giant police officer came to me and he says, you have to run. I said, I can't run, my knees are swollen. He said, you're gonna have to get on your knees and crawl in. He said, because we have reports of more explosions. And that's when I started crawling and I saw this guy fall behind me and his comrades came to his aid. They dragged him to safety. Um, I was looking for, for an ambulance for my knees and at that time they told me, we gotta walk 20 blocks to a um, to refuge. Uh, before I got there, I would this news grabbed me and started interviewing me. Uh, and that, that's basically it. <clears throat> to those unfamiliar with the official story of WTC7, this might seem like just another account of the terror, confusion, and heroism that the victims of that day faced during their harrowing ordeal. But this is not the case. Jennings' story is in fact full of details that directly contradict NIST's pronouncements on the destruction of the building. Most notably, Jennings' vivid description of the explosions that were taking place in the building during his ordeal is in direct contradiction to NIST's assertion in its FAQ on WTC7 that, although NIST investigated the possibility of explosions contributing to the building's demolition, NIST concluded that blast events inside the building did not occur and found no evidence supporting the existence of a blast event. In fact, not only is there ample evidence, available to anyone interested, that there were explosions going on in the building shortly before it went down,
uh, you know, we heard this this sound that sounded like a clap of thunder. You want to call, oh. you, you call your mother or something? But Jennings' personal account confirms that there were numerous explosions taking place inside WTC7 in the morning, hours before the building was destroyed. The BBC, in its Conspiracy Files program on The Third Tower, tries to muddy the waters by implying that the explosions that Jennings testified to were in fact the dust and debris from the Twin Towers demolitions impacting Building 7. At, at that time, I received a phone call from one of my higher-ups. And um, he said, where are you? And I said, I'm at, you know, the emergency command center. A long pause. And then he came back and he said, get out of there, get out of there now. At 9.59, the 1,300-foot South Tower collapses. I wanted to get out of that building in a hurry. So I started, instead of taking one step at a time, I'm jumping landings. When I reached down to the sixth floor, there was this eerie sound. The whole building went dark, and the staircase that I was standing on just gave way. At 10.28, the North Tower collapses in just 11 seconds. With their editing and narrative intrusions, the BBC makes it seem that the explosions that Jennings and Hess experienced were just remnants of the Twin Towers hitting WTC7. But in his interview with Dylan Avery and Jason Burmis, Jennings was completely adamant that he could still see both towers standing after the explosions happened. What happened was, when we made it back to the 8th floor, as I told you earlier, yes. both buildings were still standing because I looked two, I looked one way, looked the other way, now there's nothing there. When I got to the sixth floor before all this happened, when I got to the sixth floor, there was an explosion. That's what forced us back to the eighth floor. Okay. Both buildings were still standing. Keep in mind, I told you the fire department came and ran. They came twice. Why? Because building tower one fell, then tower two fell. And then when they came back, they came back with all concern now, like, to get me the hell out of there. And, and they did. And we got out of there. I got in the building way before, a little before nine, a little after nine. Not, not, I didn't get out of there until, like, one. It's important to note that Jennings' story does not present a different view of the official story of 9-11. It undermines that story entirely. Multiple explosions taking place in the lower floors of Building 7 before the Twin Towers' destruction, shows that NIST was wrong to dismiss the possibility of explosive demolition of WTC-7. Given that the explosions that trapped Jennings and Hess was not falling debris from the Twin Towers, and was not a fuel oil tank explosion, a point stressed by Jennings and confirmed by NIST, then the most likely possibility, pre-planted explosives that were timed to go off during the attacks, remains not only uncontested, but unconsidered by NIST or any other investigative agency. Indeed, the 9-11 Commission, which called Jennings in to question him about his story in one closed-door meeting that was never followed up, did not even mention the stunning, symmetrical, free-fall demolition of World Trade Center Building 7 in its final report on the attacks. The BBC, as we have seen, attempted to bring Jennings' story in line with the official story by purposely misleading its viewers about the timeline that Jennings himself insisted on. And NIST, infamously, took seven years to finally offer an account of Building 7's collapse. An account so absurd as to be self-refuting. Here's a video taken on 9-11 that shows WTC-7 collapsing. Note the kink in the east penthouse and the progression of the screening wall and the west penthouse collapsing from east to west. Here is our structural model showing the building collapsing, which matches quite, quite well with the video of the event.
most remarkable of all, and conveniently left out of the account of every so-called debunker of Jennings' testimony, is what Jennings himself felt about the destruction of Building 7. Well, I'm just confused about one thing, and one thing only. Why World Trade Center 7 went down in the first place. I'm very confused about that. I know what I heard. I heard explosions. The, the, the um, expl explanation I got was it was the uh, fuel oil tank. I'm an old boiler guy. If it was a fuel oil tank, it would have been one side of the building. When I got to that lobby, the lobby was totally destroyed. It looked like King Kong had came through it and stepped on it. And I, it was so destroyed, I didn't know where I was. And it was so destroyed, they had to take me out to a hole in the wall, a makeshift hole that I believe the fire department made to get me out. Given Barry Jennings' personal experience, what did he make of the BBC's attempts to alter the timeline of his story? How did he react to the official government viewpoint that no explosions took place in the building that day? What did he think of NIST's refusal to even examine the evidence of controlled demolition of WTC-7, or their own computer-generated model of how thermal expansion and regular office fires brought down a 47-story steel-framed office tower? Sadly, we will never know. When Dylan Avery and Jason Burmis released a small clip of their interview, Jennings' job was threatened, and he asked that the interview not be included in Loose Change Final Cut. The full interview was not released until after the BBC released their Third Tower documentary, in which Jennings claimed to be unhappy with how his testimony was portrayed by Avery and Burmis. No further interview or follow-up with Jennings about his comments or about the way the BBC portrayed his story was possible. In September 2008, just as NIS was presenting its final report concluding that WTC-7 had spontaneously collapsed from ordinary office fires, it was reported that Barry Jennings had passed away in hospital the month before. No further details of his death were offered. Dylan Avery, seeking to bring closure to Barry Jennings' life, answer questions about his death, and honor the bravery of a 9-11 survivor who spoke the truth even when it was unpopular, hired a private investigator to determine the circumstances of Jennings' death. In a remarkable and bizarre turn of events, however, after pursuing the case, the investigator referred the matter to the police, refunded his fee, and told Avery never to contact him again. To this day, no time or cause of death of Barry Jennings has ever been publicly announced or confirmed. Despite the sad and confused ending of this tale, there is still hope. Hope that the courage Jennings had in standing up and telling the truth, even though it was not what the government, NIST, or the promoters of the official 9-11 story wanted to hear, will not be wasted. Hope that, ultimately, the historical record, and the truth itself, will out. I think the strongest lesson to be learned about Barry Jennings is that the historical record is the historical record, no matter how you hard you try to spin it. For instance, you know, now with these dark overlord documents leaking, uh, there's litigation talking about the transformers being blown up in the bottom of the building. Okay, now if that had happened, we would have had a visual event much like what happened with the Con Edison transformer blowing, um, what, less than six months ago. It did not happen. And yet, on paper and litigation, and in official documents, it does again and again. Well, it's a cover-up. The man stepped over bodies. We know that happened. He and Hess both talked about internal explosions. That building housed the CIA, the Secret Service, the SEC. Uh, I mean, I go on. It's unbelievable. And I really hope with this latest litigation, we finally get to the truth, no matter what. And I would hope that Barry would want the truth no matter what he may have said in that BBC documentary, because I spent time with the man, I was in his back seat, and he sure as hell wanted the truth then. And so now, all these years later, those who are still seeking the truth are left in the same position as Barry Jennings himself was when he first talked to Dylan Avery and Jason Burmis. Looking at his own experience inside WTC7 on 9-11, 
and the government's official explanation of those experiences, and realizing that the two do not add up. Jennings and the other 9-11 whistleblowers are those special few who can stand up and say that the Emperor is not wearing any clothes. Well, I'm just confused about one thing and one thing only. Why World Trade Center 7 went down in the first place. I'm very confused about that. I know what I heard. I heard explosions. Secret Pentagon Intelligence Unit, codenamed Able Danger. Clearly there was something wrong here, and the story was not explaining what we needed to know. There's a problem, it's a, it's a 30 year old conspiracy. It should be apparent by this point that the old argument that someone would have talked is not just fallacious, but factually incorrect. There have, in fact, been numerous whistleblowers with documentable evidence of the frauds and fictions that have been constructed around the official 9-11 narrative. Since the day of 9-11, we've been told what happened. Freedom itself is under attack. We've been told who to blame. The Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Osama bin Laden. Terrorists and the terrorist network. Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda. We've been told what to think. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. But if you haven't seen 9-11 Trillions or 9-11 War Games, you don't know anything about 9-11. Some might ask, how in the world could the Secretary of Defense attack the Pentagon in front of its people? We had four war games going on on September 11th. $8.5 trillion. The most extraordinary coincidences in the history of mankind. You've never seen so much real world stuff happen during an exercise. It, it is, um, I was going to say terrifying. 9-11 Trillions and 9-11 War Games. Watch the documentaries for free online. CorbettReport.com On the morning of September 11, 2001, 19 men armed with box cutters directed by a man on dialysis in a cave fortress halfway around the world using a satellite phone and a laptop directed the most sophisticated penetration of the most heavily defended airspace in the world. Overpowering the passengers and the military combat trained pilots on four commercial aircraft before flying those planes wildly off course for over an hour without being molested by a single fighter interceptor. These 19 hijackers, devout religious fundamentalists who like to drink alcohol, snort cocaine, and live with pink-haired strippers, managed to knock down three buildings with two planes in New York. While in Washington, a pilot who couldn't handle a single-engine Cessna was able to fly a 757 in an 8,000-foot descending 270-degree corkscrew turn to come exactly level with the ground, hitting the Pentagon in the budget analyst office where DOD staffers were working on the mystery of the $2.3 trillion that Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld had announced missing from the Pentagon's coffers in a press conference the day before, on September 10th, 2001. Luckily, the news anchors knew who did it within minutes. Osama bin Laden. The pundits knew within hours. Osama bin Laden. The administration knew within the day. Terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. And the evidence literally fell into the FBI's lap. That a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. But for some reason, a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists demanded an investigation into the greatest attack on American soil in history. That investigation was delayed, underfunded, set up to fail, a conflict of interest, and a cover-up from start to finish. It was based on testimony extracted through torture, the records of which were destroyed. It failed to mention the existence of WTC-7, Abel Danger, p -Tech, Sibel Edmonds, OBL and the CIA, and the drills of hijacked aircraft being flown into buildings that were being simulated at the precise same time that those events were actually happening. It was lied to by the Pentagon, the CIA, the Bush administration, 
And as for Bush and Cheney, well, no one knows what they told it because they testified in secret, off the record, not under oath, and behind closed doors. It didn't bother to look at who funded the attacks because that question is ultimately of little practical significance. Still, the 9-11 Commission did brilliantly answering all of the questions the public had, except most of the victim's family members' questions, and pinned blame on all the people responsible, although no one so much as lost their job, determining the attacks were failure of imagination. Because... Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes in the buildings. Except the Pentagon, FEMA, NORAD, and the NRO. The DIA destroyed 2.5 terabytes of data on able danger, but that's okay because it probably wasn't important. The SEC destroyed their records on the investigation into the insider trading before the attacks, but that's okay because destroying the records of the largest investigation in SEC history is just part of routine record keeping. NIST has classified the data that they used for their model of WTC7's collapse, but that's okay because knowing how they made their model of the collapse would jeopardize public safety. The FBI has argued that all material related to their investigation of 9-11 should be kept secret from the public, but that's okay because the FBI probably has nothing to hide. This man never existed, nor is anything he had to say worthy of your attention, and if you say otherwise, you are a paranoid conspiracy theorist and deserve to be shunned by all of humanity. Likewise him, 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 and her. And her, and her, and him. Osama bin Laden lived in a cave fortress in the hills of Afghanistan, but somehow got away. Then he was hiding out in Tora Bora, but somehow got away. Then he lived in Abbottabad for years, taunting the most comprehensive intelligence dragnet employing the most sophisticated technology in the history of the world for a decade, releasing video after video with complete impunity and getting younger and younger as he did so, before finally being found in a daring SEAL team raid which wasn't recorded on video, in which he didn't resist or use his wife as a human shield, and in which these crack special forces operatives panicked and killed this unarmed man, supposedly the best source of intelligence about those dastardly terrorists on the entire planet. Then they dumped his body in the ocean before telling anyone about it. Then a couple dozen of that team's members died in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan. This is the story of 9-11, brought to you by the media which told you the hard truths about His head could be seen to move violently forward. And They took the babies out of incubators. And Mobile production facilities. And The rescue of Jessica Lynch. If you have any questions about this story, you are a batshit, paranoid, tinfoil, dog-abusing baby hater and will be reviled by everyone. If you love your country and or freedom, happiness, rainbows, rock and roll, puppy dogs, apple pie, and your grandma, you will never ever express doubts about any part of this story to anyone. Ever. This has been a public service announcement by the friends of the FBI, CIA, NSA, DIA, SEC, MSM, White House, NIST, and the 9-11 Commission. Because ignorance is strength.